Good morning, everyone. It is great to see your lovely faces this morning. I'm pleased to take over the stage now. Um, and it's a great honor to address you today on this great topic. I also share a rare, very rare privilege of having done something very similar in the inaugural Republica Accra in December. We, I want to acknowledge this conference for how it has really embodied what it means to coexist in a digital society today. The theme for Republica Accra was next level. And the TLDR, TLDR of the stock, for, especially for those milling out, is that we do need to go back to some basics to get to the next level. Also, the technological or the technical is political. I aim to be descriptive rather than prescriptive in my intervention here today because I don't presume to have the answers to many of the questions I and you probably also will raise today and throughout our time here at Republica. We all know that uh, digitalization has brought numerous benefits from convenience and ease of communications to easing movements of goods and services across the globe. But let's take a trip down memory lane to when this digitalization started to kick off. So I've sort of fast forwarded from where Mr. President got us from 200 years, just come to the last 20 or so years in my uh, taking you down the memory lane. So those days when internet access was starting to become more accessible to most of us, um, for some it was dial-up, for some it was mobile internet, for some it was going to cyber cafes, it was the flip phones, it was now the smartphones, it was the dawn of social media and the great promise that was held then. Communication took on new, exciting forms. We started to see transcending of physical boundaries, and this is particularly so for people who are typically not existing or living in communities where it's easy to go to, from one country to the next. But enter these communication tools, and each of us could plug into conversations in real time that people in other uh, jurisdictions were having, and those boundaries that existed in the physical domain started to be brought down bit by bit. We started to speak of and started exploring the whole idea and potential of citizen journalism. Any one of us could be a news source. Um, we saw revolution starting to be powered by this connectivity. And there's really great promise of what could happen. The world was truly ours to reorder by leveraging these technologies. We could play games, we could look at fun memes, with all sorts of fun quizzes that we took on. We shared so many aspects and could now share so many aspects of our lives in completely new ways. Well, more, of a, more and more of us have been plugged into these uh, internet-powered tools and platforms. Some among us have grown to be with these platforms in their hands. The folks at TinCon, for example, are what are called digital natives. The, as they were learning to crawl, they were learning to swipe for some of them. Arguably, we have all seen opportunity. The reality is we're starting to realize we saw opportunity differently. There just did happen while we were plugging in to be all these cute little, just little huddles to get over. You know, the T's and C's, the EULA, and other such acronyms. I mean, what the hell? So we ticked yes. We're like, okay, fun awaits on the other side. Let's get there. Enter TLDR. Too long, didn't read. The internet speak du jour. Uh, why we are gathered here today. This culture of conceding that the terms and conditions we expected to review before accepting to use these favorite platforms of ours are too long and too technical for us to pour over. Convenience, fun, memes, and more await uh, wait on the other side. To me, TLDR is a shortcut to playing the game and hoping that the rules are fair. We'll figure it out as we go along, or at least we will thrive regardless. And unsurprisingly so, it's been said that it would take uh, over 70 days, working days, to actually through, read through all the terms and conditions of any of the favorite tools or platforms you use today. 
Who has got that much time? Nor can you necessarily opt out of some of the clauses. It tends to be an all or nothing kind of affair. So what would be the incentive to even bother with reading in the first place? I'll draw parallels here to how we also consume information today. It's practically impossible to take in all that is out there and dig deeper into backstories, into contexts, into other versions of events of any one story or any one um, unfolding issue. So in this resulting attention economy, cultivated by our increased online activity, the information superhighways in which we exist, this TLDR becomes a survival tool, a means to somewhat be informed about some things, not necessarily all of them, to sort of be woke-ish. Um, and this is a case for ordinary citizens, as it is for any political industry leaders alike. TLDR is a compromise between consuming and contributing. There are costs to participating and also to not participating. There's influence that is at stake. We have followers. There are all these things we need to contribute to to get some value out of being connected, if you will. But often, he or she who shouts the loudest or wields the most influence, however we arrive at that, is the one who gets our attention. So TLDR is perhaps our signal for curated or more contextualized information because there's so much of it in abundance. We seek explanation in simpler terms, 140 characters, 280 characters, compelling videos, snaps, disappearing stories, to pack in the most information in the least amount of time, for time is increasingly a rare commodity. So TLDR has been the shifting goalpost as the means by which we consume content shift, or as innovations are made even more available to either keep us informed, keep us hooked, or both. We're now realizing, and some more painfully than others, that there are serious costs to TLDR as the modus operandi. Risks and very serious threats have started to close in on us. These online platforms we congregate to, we have all started to realize are being very easily misappropriated. So the revelations of how all these sites have been weaponized have become the stuff of new news headlines and practically uh, occupying all spheres of discussions today. Those cutesy, fun games we played turned out to be instruments for quantifying us. Little did we know that that cathartic um, exercise that we were in was actually meaning so much more, so much more value was being harnessed by some actors. The intricacies we've shared, our thoughts, our pictures, there were char turbocharging systems that now even dare to predict what we might do next, and they tried to shepherd us towards taking certain decisions and actions. So now we exist in this crazy pendulum, where we go from trying to speak to truth to power through these platforms, to realizing on the other side that what is being created is a new, scary, seemingly untamed form of power. We are somewhere between exercising free speech and freedom of expression to dealing with misinformation or fake news, as it's been called by others, all in a very toxic online environment. Algorithms, merchants of convenience, were supposed to optimize our experiences online. But we are realizing now that they have been abused right from design. And now we're at a point where we have to contend with whether they have been doing more harm than good. TLDR culture has caught up with us, and now we have to calculate the cost. So on one hand, digitalization means that we're more informed, we're more engaged, we are seemingly more enlightened. But at the same time, we are increasingly disillusioned and learning that we haven't always had the full picture. Now, and this is just as a reality of half of the global population that is currently connected today. The web, as we, as most friendly way to connect to the internet, turned 30 on March 12th. And just around that time, we've reached the 50% mark of the world being connected. There's another 50% of this global population that is not connected. And as was mentioned earlier, others are just opting out altogether. Equality via digitalization remains a mirage. It remains elusive. The reality is that the inequalities that exist offline are starting to reflect and rear the very ugly head online. Contrary to the lofty dream that these spaces would be for everyone. And the architects had a dream. Build it, they will come. Move fast, break things. Avail it and everyone will connect and we'll all sing Kumbaya and make the world a better place. The reality was a whole other matter altogether. 
So we also have to ask ourselves, is this the same space that we want to connect another 50% of the population? Many of whom, by the way, exist at the intersection of so many inequalities. They are the ones who've been traditionally left behind. We now are going, are we really going to plug them into the same space that has become so toxic? There was a goal uh, that the world agreed upon to connect everyone to the internet by 2030. That is going to be missed, one, because there was complete failure of imagination and tempering the excitement around how it is that internet would, uh, you know, be rolled out. And at the same time, this normalized culture of TLDR has become a powerful tool for obfuscation. The true costs of plugging in are laid out in hundreds of pages of legalese, but the pictures that we are more easily and readily interact with are all quite evangelistic. All about how our lives will be made so much better if we opt in today or right now. Underlying that little I agree box is a space to tuck away all the potential risks and trade-offs. You have to dig deep to find out how you're actually going to be affected. Well, we agreed, and now we're learning the hard way just what it is we agreed to. It turns out it's, just, it's not just about the tech. It's intricately linked to life as we know it, as we imagine it, and as we experience it. Here I'll draw parallel to politics in society offline as well. Well, also with the caveat that nowadays online and offline is really not a distinction to make for many of us. We've seen popular campaign slogans painting convenient pictures, peddling all manner of promises to woo voters, with the full picture only unfolding after the fact, essentially leading to crises in democratic engagements because understandably we feel duped. Media and the business of keeping us informed has been a serious casualty of the waves of digitalization. As media industries globally have, sh have struggled with finding their place in a reality where anyone can be a news source, too often they have fallen into the TLDR cycle. They have to craft TLDR type of headlines and stories to monetize our attention as their business models have been vastly challenged. Meanwhile, power dynamics have shifted fundamentally. At some point, it seemed as though we assigned trust to these tech giants who innovated us into the space we are in today. Uh, we trusted their pitches, we believed them, we let them be for fear of punishing innovation. We welcomed disruption. And I do believe there was with the best of intentions, but you know what they say about the road to hell. Our trust in them has been exploited to serious detrimental effects, much in the same way that our trust in uh, representative political institutions, governments, if you will, is rapidly fading because rather than living up to the promise, technologies and, government, and governance and that un very interesting marriage of them has become a battlefield for power and domination. So it's like we're waking up from a hypnosis to find the power dynamics in the society have fundamentally shifted, and now we have to take stock of how we got here. Our new reality is that some of these companies have profited so vastly from commodifying our blind worship of tech innovation and disruption. Some are even richer than entire nation states. Some have come to embody the entire experience of some people's uh, online uh, existence. For, to them, certain platforms are the entirety of the internet. Worshipping at the altar of tech innovation and disruption and buying into the hype that the solution to many a world problem was more digitalization is all starting to come to a head. So di disruption is truly upon us and it's increasingly not looking like the great promise it was touted to be. Meanwhile, our hacks to navigate these intersections are largely falling short. Now, it's not for me to judge if TLDR is a good or bad thing. I understand firsthand that it feels necessary and has felt necessary as a viable coping mechanism. But our shared values, our rights, our human agency have been serious casualties as a result. Trust in pretty much everything and everyone we elect or we expect to represent us is waning across the globe. We thought we were singing from the same hymn book about what human rights mean and ethics and all that jazz, but we're finding out that the, how, the choir was actually quite discordant. So now what happens when we are reacting rather than shaping our futures, which are increasingly digital, considering that the TLDR vehicle has been on the move with very few of us in the driver's seat? Who is to be held to account and how? 
What does all this mean going forward? And especially as effects of TLDR become more apparent with how tech platforms and even democracies have run amok. Could we even opt out if we wanted to today? How could we do so if it's all TLDR? Do we have viable alternatives through which to still enjoy the net benefits of congregating and coexisting virtually on some platforms without having to worry if the next click is going to be a minefield of misinformation and conspiracy theories over your data being harvested to feed the ad machinery powering this online space? Whose job is it to save all of us? Strange times these, to be so informed, so enlightened, so connected, yet so disillusioned. So I don't think TLDR is solely a result of digitalization. I think it's just more visible because of this digital convenience trade-off. I think that it has been about surviving in an increasingly harsh world where each of us, and most of us really, have to double down on making it through every single day, hoping to figure out a plan for navigating through tomorrow or the day after. The technical, we are now realizing, is deeply political. It does not exist in a vacuum, never did. Move fast and break things has, become, has broken societies. So I believe it's an opportune moment for us to revisit how we negotiate spaces of coexistence, of representation, of our immediate past and future, both online and offline. TLDR, in my view, speaks to the need to reinvigorate and redesign our institutions and uh, governments and forms of governance at local, regional, and global levels. We can't engage in every issue in society today, and that is why we seek representation. But we absolutely need that representation to constantly serve what we have elected it to do. Representation, and anyone who works in, uh, for, to represent any constituency, has to go back to realizing it's about humility and it's about service. It is time for us to reconfigure to whom we defer expertise, to figure out how to hold them to account in every step of the way, from politicians to tech mavens alike. You know, those who dared to challenge this narrative as we were lulled in the wave of tech hype were often called detractors and Debbie Downers. Well, today I want to salute them all. And I want to salute them all because they could easily be telling us, I told you so. But there's somewhere in humility helping us accept and make sense of the mess, glorious mess we find ourselves in today. And now we must realize also that the solution here is not more technology. We must, uh, we must start to understand that there are such strong linkages between these technologies, how they evolve, how they're imagined, how they're designed, how they're deployed to the political economies we exist in today. It is time to redesign reform and sustain the kind of organizations we need for this age, from the hyper-local to those that shape the new or global international commons. This, by the way, is the space to re reform the whole idea that the Western ideals are what shape the world. As I said in Accra, and I will say here again today, we are changing the whole idea of how expertise and who an expert is expected to look like. This is about the role of citizen collectives such as cooperatives, unions, and others who work on our behalf of our stated interests to convene, collaborate, and co-create the futures we want. It's very much about the role of governments and social political representation, but also how we reinvigorate our civic engagement, our active cultivation of discourses, terms and conditions, laws and policies that govern the offline and online spaces in which we exist. It's about what social, cultural, political currencies we use to sustain the representation we definitely need. It is about justice. Technology and politics have to serve the public interest. It's about reclaiming our power and agency to fight back against this growing sense of helplessness that is creeping upon us all. And for some, this might mean that you delete or detox from this crazy TLDR diet, well and good. But for others, that is simply not an option. It's not a one-size-fits-all uh, solution here either. Yet we must arrive at some commons in the spaces through which we are represented. So it's a very crazy task, but a very exciting one, depending on how you want to look at it. At stake here is our shared human values, our human rights, our human agency. And trust does need to be recultivated urgently before we splinter off into self-selecting fear fearful groups online and offline. 
So let me just share with you how I'm practically trying to walk the talk here. One thing I like to say is that I exist to claim spaces and narratives not imagined for people like myself. Whatever you see in how I look here today, whatever you think I represent as a corner of the world, I stand here to claim that there's a whole other way that we need to envision the whole idea of who understands what tech means, what society means, what politics means for our societies today. I believe that it's about taking a lateral and not just a vertical view. It's also standing here with great humility, recalling and remembering those who have not even been able to, to lend their voices to this whole madness we're living through today, because historically, they've always been the people for whom people act. They are always the beneficiaries. I want to have us challenge the whole idea of who's a beneficiary, who's a creator, who's an inventor, and who knows what's what about our society today. I call upon all of us to go back to that humility. I, and I also, just because I like to live in an existing crazy world of madness, I've been trying to figure out how to cultivate spaces and new ways to gather governments, private sector, and civil society, but as equals on the table, to debate and address these issues. In truth, nobody has an answer. In truth, if you go to any table and everyone says that they have solution X or Y, you need to tell them to calm down and show they're working. Let's get into the TLDR of their solutions. We need to address these solutions and we need to find the pain points, and this is a very fast and slow process. We're not going to figure it out tomorrow, but we have to keep trying. So very practically in my work at the World Wide Web Foundation, one very practical way we've tried to, to address the issue of getting everyone connected to affordable and meaningful access to the internet is through the Alliance for Affordable Internet, where we gather governments, private sector, civil society at both hyper-local, regional, global levels, and really try to create that equal space for everyone to bring their expertise, to, uh, for all those envisioned beneficiaries to actually dictate the terms in which any solution we bring to the table will work for their benefits, because they're the experts on their own lived experiences. Um, so Tim Berners-Lee, uh, when marking the um, 30th anniversary of the web, called out for a new contract for the web that is trying to bring together the same actors to build a ro roadmap for how we build a web that serves humanity and is a public good for everyone, everywhere. Through the UN and the Secretary General's office, I was invited to find ways uh, of working together again with governments, civil society, private sector, from all, the globes, uh, all walks of life in the globe, to find ways of working together to address the societal, ethical, legal, and economic impacts of digital technologies so we maximize benefits to societies and minimize harms. To me, this has meant figuring out how International organizations, whether new or existing, can truly embody this mantra of leaving no one behind. And for me, it's, I, I'm, I'm just wholly convinced it's about centering the most marginalized in how we discuss how we are creating spaces at the international level. It is to listen to them. It is to work with them and not assume solutions for them. It is not perfect. I won't lie, it's not easy, nor is it enough. But it's a start. It's the start I have I've made. So in effect, digitalization is going to continue turbocharging our political, civic, social, and economic uh, shifts in society today. We absolutely must have it maximize the benefits and minimize the harms to our online off and offline presence and futures. So let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's find spaces to go cultivate the basics of inquiry, of addressing our hopes and fears, our frustrations, our theories, negotiate our coexistence, again, right from the hyper-local to the global. So start with Republica today. Start by going to a session that is typically out of your realm of expertise. Start by having a conversation with someone who looks different or is different from what you, the kind of person you speak, typically speak to. Just see what that does to your brain, you know? Just find ways to stimulate another way of thinking about things. Not because you're trying to work on any agenda, but just because you're trying to re-exercise the whole idea of being a human being. And it's really a being about coexistence. But also gird your fervor, because we, I believe we all want to see change. Do not give in. It won't all happen today, but we must not give up. We must not settle for the TLDR culture as the only way out, because that keeps us in survival mode when indeed we were meant to thrive. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Nigeria. I love you. I love you more. Thank you. Thank you so much for rocking our stage, both in Accra and here in Berlin. We're not going to do a Q&A here, but only because you have an Ask Me Anything session coming up, which is going to take place at our Republica International Space right this way. Yeah. So look forward to seeing you there and then having space and time for all your questions. Wonderful. See you Thank later. You. Thank you so much. Yeah.